Today I'm going to be talking about uh, CAD access with Hoops Exchange and PRC. Um, the objective is to give you a technical insight into the Hoops Exchange toolkits, uh, focusing on the 3D model representation, um, looking at the basic capabilities. Um, I'll walk through some simple code samples, uh, and 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 I'll also I'll focus on the PRC data model, particularly. Uh, product structure, uh, and more particularly uh, geometry and topology, the boundary representation and tessellation. Um, following that, I'll talk a little about using the exchange toolkit with other tools, some of our own and some external tools. And finally, uh, briefly discuss where you can go from here. And in putting this together, I've tried to get a balanced presentation. Um, uh, Jonathan mentioned we've got these high level presentations tomorrow. Um, so this, this is more technical than that, but it's not so technical. There are some elements of code and data structures and, di uh, uh, and uh, data flow diagrams, but it's not so complicated that it shouldn't be useful to follow just to understand some of the basic concepts in Hoops in PLC. So, Hoops Exchange is one of four toolkits that we develop here at TechSoft 3D. Um, the others are uh, Visualize and Communicator, which are graphics uh, toolkits, one for the uh, desktop and mobile applications, and the other for a web-based um, uh, application. The other is Hoops Publish. But the common thing that all of them have is that they're all focused on engineering data flows. That's what we do at TechSoft, and that's what Exchange is about. It's about obtaining data, engineering data from multiple uh, CAD systems. And just to give you an idea of the uh, formats that we can support, um, this the number of formats uh, increases. It, um, Gradually, particularly more recently in the uh, visualization and BIM formats is an area where we're seeing some growth, but we're, our core representations are mechanical engineering formats from the major CAD vendors. So if you look at this diagram, you can see there's many different CAD systems uh, mentioned here. The major vendors, Siemens, Dassault Systems, Autodesk, and we support reading of the, all the formats you see listed on this diagram. In addition, we also write to those formats that you see in blue. Um, in general, what we're about is supporting engineering data, uh, workflow. So typically we want to access as much information as possible from those formats and then pass it into downstream applications, either through a direct integration to a, maybe an application kernel modeler or else through file export. And when we do file export, we're looking at the kind of independent standards for data transfer, STEP, IGES. And, and um, JT, although it belongs to Siemens, is actually a de facto standard, particularly in the automotive industry. Uh, the other formats you can see we have export to are XT and ACES represent the kernel modelers that are behind uh, several CAD systems. So there is one exception to the rule that we read everything here, and that's this one format, 3MF, that's in orange. Um, as a company, we've been tracking uh, auto, uh, uh, 3D printing um, and additive manufacturing for some years, and we have many partners in this field. We supported 3MF export a, a little while ago because we, we anticipated it becoming more of an established standard that it has here. In, in my experience so far, it's not really established itself as a standard, but nevertheless, we continue to support it for export purposes. Okay, so we support reading, reading of the data from these different CAD formats. Where, on what platform uh, can you read it? Well, the answer is on many different platforms, as you can see here, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, and also we support the mobile platforms, Android and iOS, so, although there are some limitations on the number of formats we can support for import and export on, uh, um, on those uh, platforms. So what we have is 
a toolkit that can read many, many CAD formats and it, it runs on multiple platforms. So having got that, what I, when we talk about reading data from these different formats, what are we actually reading? Well, what we're reading uh, essentially is everything we can. Uh, we like to read the model tree, the BREP and mesh data. I'll, I'll, go, I'll define what we mean by BREP later on in the talk. Uh, visualization information, product manufacturing information, views and other data. And these concepts, uh, we represent if you like a superset of all the data that can be represented amongst these formats. Now, many of these formats are, have um, a very common core, but there's sometimes some outriders in terms of the different format, uh, different CAD systems. Um, in addition, some visualization formats may contain much less kind of data relative to manufacturing than, you, than say a CAD format. You'd expect that. So having read all this data, we don't expect you to program against every single CAD format there. All the data we pull into uh, Hoops Exchange is represented by what we call the PRC data model. So it stands for Product Representation Compact. And it's an accurate uh, compressed format that's a rich data model. And it's, it's actually an, defined in an ISO standard. And some of you may already be aware that same PRC format is also used in this 3D PDF uh, as a mo model representation for archiving CAD data. So to move on, uh, I'm going to concentrate mostly on BREP and mesh, talk about BREP and mesh representation and visualization uh, information in this talk. A lot of the data um, slides that I've pulled out of uh, a training course, uh, which is typically two or three days. And I would not expect as it pr it'd be practical to go into all the ins and outs of a hoops exchange. But what I want to get over is what these core concepts are. So if you're integrating with hoops exchange, the things you need to think about in terms of common workflows, such as human markup or model interrogation. Now, I talked, uh, talked about the product tree or the product structure, um, it, or you may refer to it as the assembly tree. We're dealing with mechanical CAD, uh, CAD systems. They're used for describing large assemblies often, sometimes for individual parts. And so the PLC data model can read the assembly tree. There may be different configurations in there. Maybe there are attributes associated uh, with uh, the assembly, you know, a part manufacturer, something like that. And also there might be some construction geometry. So when we, so in terms of basic reading, the first thing you're going to look at is the, pro, um, the product structure. Having read the overall assembly structure, if you like, you're then really interested in the model representation of individual parts. And this is when BREP or boundary rep comes into its own. Boundary representation, it's the heart of most uh, CAD uh, modeling engines, ACES, Parasolid, uh, CGM, uh, multiple multiple uh, modelers have, uh, have used BREP for a long time now. It's a well-established technology, technology, and essentially you're dealing with a representation of the topology and the geometry. So we can read that in Hoops Exchange, and I'm really going to go into a lot more detail on this and export that data, as I've already mentioned, to some common interchange formats. The, when we talk about BREP, we're talking about the exact descriptions of a surface. But if you're doing visualization type of workflows, as most people on this call will be aware, when you render graphics uh, objects, you're really most of the time dealing with triangles, tessellated data, polygonal data. And that Hoops um, Exchange can generate that visualization information uh, 
and read it from files where it's there. So, I mean, so essentially, these are the three things that we're going to talk about today. Reading, reading a model, gaining access to the, uh, the boundary representation, looking at some visualization information. So, what's in the toolkit? Let me let me see if I can just share my my screen or the screen at this point. I think I might just drag uh, Visual Studio over here. So, one moment. Okay, so. As you would expect, working as a uh, TechSoft employee, I have multiple copies of our uh, toolkits installed on my machine. Um, but to, to, to go to a more recent one, um, you, when you download our toolkit, essentially, you, in most of our toolkit, all of our toolkits, in fact, you get a very common structure. So you pull down the toolkit, you've got access to documentation, um, we've got the binary files representing the DLLs, which form the heart of the reader. Uh, and also we have some code samples as well. And so I've already, uh, I'm going to go through some, some of these code samples, um, and let's show you, show you what's in there. Uh, so let me bring developer studio up. You'll have to forgive me, I've moved my monitors around just so I can get the camera right on this presentation. So, there we go. That's better. Okay, so this is an installation for Hoops Visualize on Windows. So there's also uh, toolkits available for the other platforms, uh, samples available for the other platforms as well. Um, as you can see, we've got various uh, code samples that we uh, sh uh, ship with the toolkit. And the ones I'm going to talk about today are this one, import export, um, PRC to XML, uh, which is uh, a tool for uh, dumping a kind of XML description of the contents of a model file, and viewer, which is a simple OpenGL based viewer for uh, viewing the data um, that, that you've read in using Hoops Exchange. And, I'm going to use this one, import export, in a moment, just to show you how simple it can be starting with Hoops Exchange. I'll use PLC to XML uh, just to provide some insight into the structure of the data that we can read. And finally, later on, we'll look at the viewer sample just as a way of how any a way of accessing the tessellation um, in a model that you've loaded in. Okay. So, um, one moment. So let's just take a look at this one, import export sample. So if we just look at this model here. Import export, it's all this file, all this uh, file, um, this sample does, and you can see the code in front of you. It reads in a model and it exports to another format. And essentially, it's as simple as that: reading a model, for, give a file name, export a file name, uh, and convert it. So, if you want to use Hoops Exchange to gain access to these thirty different formats and convert them into a downstream workflow and do that from code, 
it's as, it's as simple as this. Now, obviously, it can get more complicated than this, and that's what we're going to talk about. But if you want to, if you want to just take a look at some of the capabilities from a pro uh, uh, in code and just get started and get into it, this is all you need to do. We've set up some classes that sit around our, uh, on top of our toolkit that makes it easy to load. That is, identify where the DLLs are, optionally facts which you don't have to do define some options for import and export the different options that i will talk about later but the default options obviously work quite well and if we look at the properties for this project you can see here that i previously set it up and run it so just if we just go to a model here one moment So this is a very simple SOLIDWORKS part here, uh, ble bleed a screw. And I'm going to use, you'll see this a lot during the next uh, 40 minutes because I'm going to use it an example for illustrating many things to do with BRAP and tessellation. And you'll probably be sick of it by the end of the call. But what I've done is run that program and here's the JT representation of that model that I converted a moment ago. And so that's it. You, I mean, the, if you really just want to take a very shallow look uh, at, at our um, uh, technology, you, you know, but still code something up, that's it. Just to go back, you know, where we, you've got, you know, 30 formats. It'll, come, it'll run on these platforms and you convert you can convert to another format with you know very little code okay so so peter i blinked so you ran that code you hit you hit start in visual studio yeah and it ran that command line executable it took the solidworks file imported it wrote it as a jt file to to your your machine like i exactly I, let let I me it. let me do let me do that again then <laughs> okay Let's, let and me then just... you loaded that into a viewer, right? So that, yeah. that Hoops demo viewer is something that you can download from our website, and it's it allows you to kind of test out different types of yeah. technology. Is that what yeah. you did? Yeah, that's exactly what I did. If you just bear with me one moment, I'm just going to alter the um, I'm just going to alter the resolution of one of my screens because it's causing me. You may have seen some problems in terms of me dragging files around on this. Okay, one moment. And so this, just, just as you're getting that Peter set up, so, so this code, Hoops Exchange, if, if the attendees would like to get access to that, as well as that demo viewer for, for visualization, uh, go to techsoft3d.com, sign up for an evaluation. We'll send you the package. All the sample code is in that package. Um, and you can, you can run this on your own files. You don't have to use a set of sample files. So any of those 30 files, it runs for, for 60, 60 days and allows you to kind of test this out um and, and use it yourself uh, yeah so let me let me do that again let me run it again so you can see i'm running in deg mo debug mode so it could be a bit slow so let's run this program and okay it's just it's run on it that that's it so it's, it's converted the file and as I mentioned previously, this was the SOLIDWORKS part, and this is a JT version of that file. Uh, and you see they look the same. Okay. So, let me, so to continue from this point here, oh, excuse me. Okay, so we've, just to recall where we've got to, you've downloaded the toolkit, we built that import-export sample um, with the, you know, three volumes of code, 
and we've converted a model. Um, but it, when we've talked about CAD format support, I just want to um, draw your attention to the fact that we're dealing with multiple uh, file formats when we're working with Hoops Exchange. So if you want to work with Hoops Exchange effectively and, um, and understand what you're reading and what you can get out of those formats, I would recommend you go and you look at the, uh, this view the, uh, in the, the latest build, the overview of Hoops Exchange, where you'll see uh, the uh, description of file formats. And just to bring it up here on the screen, as you can see, that link will take you to this page and this this familiar diagram is here. And if you scroll down below that, you'll see that there's a table listing all the formats that we, we support. Uh, and the core data that we kind of, which platforms are supported on, whether or not we, we're able to read tessellation, BREP, whether that formats, uh, that concept is even supported, in that, in that particular CAD file. Uh, and, and so for instance, if we're looking at, for instance, BREP, uh, there just isn't the concept of boundary representation in some of these formats. Uh, and, and so OBJ is becoming uh, more popular for visualization again, even though it's an old format and, and, and it supports tessellation, we can read that, but it, these formats are not really for serious mechanical engineering data. They do not support product manufacturing information and they do not have BREP data, but they can still be useful for visualization workflows. Now, just again, for those of you who are already working with Hoops Exchange and uh, or those of you starting evaluation, with regard to specific features of any individual file format, you'll, you'll see that we list the versions that we support and we do have this summary table. But I re highly recommend that when you're working with formats, that you, you follow these links and down to each and each individual description. So for each reader and writer, we, we describe the individual capabilities of um, of our of our readers and writers. For instance, this one's for Katia. You can see which surface types we can read from Katia, what visualization information we can get, whether we support the notion of views, what product manufacturing information we can do, and various other um, information. And and take note of this section at the bottom. We have a very comprehensive reader. We'd like to uh, hopefully think it's as the, uh, you know, the best solution out there for reading CAD data, but we're still gonna come across, uh, you're still gonna cross limitations sometimes. And so make sure if you really, to su fully support your workflow for any particular CAD formats, you don't have to, necessarily program against all these different CAD formats, but you should know what to expect when you're reading a file. So, you know, don't read an, an OBJ file and then say there's no BREP in it, okay. Okay, we, we, we talked about that code, I uh, showed you that code sample earlier. I mean, just to, show you again this is you know that is the essential code of that code sample okay so we've done the we've done the easy bit at this stage we've i've shown you you can get the you can get the toolkit you can install it uh, and the installation is unzipping it and you can build those code samples and you can convert some files um so what is going into a bit more detail on the PLC data model? What are the, some of the key concepts there? Um, well, at the assembly tree level, the key, con uh, the top level, the root is the model file, and then we have um, 
the product a product occurrence i'll go into more detail on this uh part definitions and representation items i'll 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 describe what what we mean by the these at the moment and so I'm going to talk about this, uh, getting the data out, uh, leading down to the part definitions and the representation items, which is where you get the BREP and the tessellation from. And finally, I'm going to talk a bit about a tree traversal algorithm to make it easier for you to walk through that data and get it in, a, in the correct way. Um, okay, so the product, when you read a file into Hoops Exchange, We've got a, a PRC data model there, and we've got what we call, talk about the structure of a model that is assemblies and subassemblies. Um, the top level is a model file, and then below that, and in and you'll see many of these if you examine the data that you get out. There are going to be multiple product occurrences. And a product occurrence represents assembly node, and it's a basis for instant. Uh, instancing as well and then below that you've got the actual part definition so we're typically when we talk about part definition we're talking about a plc data definition and and that usually corresponds to a single part you might think of physically however there can be some exceptions in some some formats i think for katia v4 for instance you uh, particularly where you've got surface models you might find that there's a kind of notional assembly structure even down at part, part level. But for the purposes of this talk, let's think of a part definition as being a single part. Okay, let me bring up the Hoops demo viewers again. So I'm going to use this Hoops demo viewer a few times during the, uh, the course of this uh, talk just to help illustrate it, um, uh, certain concepts. The we, don't, we don't supply the source code for Hoops Demo Viewer. It's just a, a download that you can get from our website. If you're an exchange, if you're an existing partner or you're evaluating, you can directly uh, download this from our developer zone. Um, we also have an accompanying one called the Hoops Parasol uh, Demo Viewer as well. So let me just, I'm going to open a, a SolidWorks assembly here. So. This is quite a complex assembly, as you can see, consisting of multiple uh, assembly, uh, sub-assemblies and, uh, and parts. So if I just open this now and do this live, I'm just, I'm, there are many different options, some of which I'll talk about later in the context of the particular uh, uh, task. But uh, let me just re make sure we're running with the defaults here, and then we'll read this model in. There we go. So if we just look at this model here and I open up the um, this is, um, browser window here, if you look here at this property win properties window on the right hand side, as I click on different objects, you'll see that this type in particular um, will, will change and the type represents a different part of our, the model structure we're looking at. So if I just click um, on this node here, and let, I've just picked one at random, let's isolate it. It's a very simple part, but you can see here, this part here is represented by a product occurrence. Uh, below that we've got, well, in fact, it's an assembly. So you can see there's some of the parts below that. And finally, the solid representation under that as well. So let's just re reset the visibility of the whole uh, part. So that's really the, the only thing I want to get over from you know, loading this model. Hey, well, hey, hopefully it seems reasonably click, uh, quick to you that at the one level we've got uh, We've got a hierarchy of product occurrences. There's usually one right at the top as well, representing the assembly and subassemblies. And right at the top of the whole data structure is uh, the model file entity. And there's usually some data associated at different levels of our PCRC. For instance, in this case, it's a very important um, piece of data are the units that the model's in. Okay, so 
that for the moment is all I want to show in terms of model structure because I'm now going to start getting a bit deeper into um, the representation of the 3D uh, part of this model. Um, so I talked about uh, model file being the root, about product occurrence being the a method of representing the assembly structure and instancing, uh, and a part really corresponding to, if you might think of a single uh, individual part that might get uh, manufactured, machined, or laid down by an additive manufacturing machine. Below that, we have what's called a representation item. So just to move on to that a bit more, so off the part definition, there are different ways of representing that item. And these are, um, I, this is all data that we read in from the CAD file, or in, sometimes in the case of tessellation data, we might generate it internally as well. So if I just draw your attention to the type of things that, for one part, we might have things like planes, point, directions, coordinate systems, kind of miscellaneous data associated with the part representation. And two key um, representation item data types are the BREP model and the poly BREP model. And of course, these are the two um, these are the two items that I'm going to talk about more today that represents the BREP and the, facet, the tessellated data, as you'd expect. Okay, so here's this part again. And let's talk a bit about the th representation item BREP model. I'm, I recognize some of you on the call and know that there's, there's some very experienced developers on the call and this is going to be something that you've ingrained into your understanding. For, but we have a mixed audience, so just to, just to go over what BREP is, it's a method used traditionally to represent solids. It's a connected set of mathematically defined surfaces that typically are tightly bound together to form a solid. And sometimes, I mean, things are more flexible than that. You can have open solids as well, but generally it's a representation of solid and, uh, solid and it's used for modeling in most engineering CAD systems. Uh, and when I talk about boundary representation, it sometimes gets used a bit loosely, but I, in this context, we really mean that combination of geometry and topology, that is the geometry, the mathematical description of the surface, whether it's a cylinder or, or a curve, which is a line, and topology, without getting into deep mathematics on this, let's think of it in terms of talking about the connectivity, two faces of uh, a solid where they meet, and, and so And just to give you um, an idea of what we mean by that in terms of um, hoops, exchange um we've got this just like we have uh, in a way we've got a hierarchy of data in terms of the higher level model structure that is model file uh, product occurrence and parts but Bel uh, below that uh, we've got a um, typical uh, boundary representation structure um for representing the brep within the pc data structure as well so at the top level, uh, we, we've got the, the whole BREP data structure. Connex typically represents um, kind of, if you like, separate lumps of material in, uh, within, within a model. Uh, a shell is a collection of faces. Typically those faces are, are grouped together to form a closed solid, but sometimes they can be open as well. Um, within um, each individual face of the solid, we've got edges and there's a notion of what an edge looks like with respect to uh, a face that's represented by something called co-edge. Uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little more about this 
and an edge is a, if you like as you would expect physically if we have a cube an edge is like sharp uh, feature that you run your tw uh, 12 of that you run you know finger along the edge and that is the 3d edge there and finally we've got the vertices as well um, so just to talk a little more about what we've got uh, we've got in terms of that um, I mentioned already a shell uh, may be open or closed. Uh, might so sort of typically a flag to let you know if that's the case. Um, you'll sometimes periodically in our data structure or any other cat, uh, modeling kernel find an orientation flag. And that is often whether or not a face is orientated to, with regard to an underlying surface, whether uh, an edge is which way it goes in direction to a, a curve and so forth. So, but these are just, when a model gets defined, sometimes you're sharing surfaces or data. So imagine you've got um, a plane which is defined and, for, uh, and different parts of the model like faces line that plane, but for some parts of the model, the plane might be facing down and for others, they may be facing up. And the same goes, for loops as well, we might have an orientation. Now, just talking about um, edges for a while, thinking of this cube again, um, we we think about an edge and you, and a cube's a pretty simple object. Uh, and that edge there may be defined in, typically in three, three dimensions. Um, and you might have a, a 3D space curve, which represents a linear edge here or something more complex um, but the way that model data gets defined in terms of BREP there may not be a 3D curve associated with a model there may just be a 2D curve uh, as well in parameter space so I, I'm so if you the important thing here and this does come up with some of our partners it, um, I should really say with some of the data that our partners get rather than with our partners, um, that you read a model, you're parsing the data and, and, and you're walking through our data structures and you find there's no edge, there's no 3D edge, and, but there may be a 2D edge or maybe your algorithm expected a 2D edge, but there's only a 3D edge. And so this is, this is just something to be aware of and something that I'll, I'll come back to later in terms of something we call model adaptation. That is when you import CAD data from an external CAD system and you want to um, use it in your own application and to do that in a consistent way so you always get the data you need. Okay, just, I, I won't dwell on this um, slide too long. Uh, and you will, as John said, you will get a copy of this presentation. But in terms of topology, uh, you've probably noticed by now, or you've worked out for yourself through using our toolkit, we have a pretty uh, consistent way of describing uh, different parts of our uh, data structures. So we're dealing with topological entities here. So uh, you'll see that all the data types uh, representing these entities are prefixed with topo. Uh, so co-edge, um, face, shell, and so forth. Now, um, we just looked at uh, a cube and and it's pretty uh, straightforward. You've got a plane, you've got linear curves, but obviously the real world is not like that. And it gets a bit more complicated than this. And you'll see in our documentation, but this is just taking a, a snapshot from our documentation, that we can support multiple different surface types, uh, as you can see here, uh, and multiple different curve types as well. And a key thing about uh, hoops exchange and the PLC data model is that it's not lossy. When we try and when we read data from these external CAD systems, we maintain that data uh, uh, as much as we can. 
you now i know that some some uh, some people uh, their applications may they may only work with nerbs or a subset of data and as uh, and we have got the capability of convert doing surface type conversion uh, in very rare circumstances and i can't remember off the top of my head what they are you might find that in very exceptional circumstances we have to approximate uh, 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 a unique surface type from a, a modeling system by a nerve surface or a unique nerves curve, uh, uh, unique curve type by a nerves curve, but that's extremely rare. And I think it, it will, I, I mentioned earlier about the importance of just checking the, the documentation on a file basis and that type of information will be listed under each file type. Okay. Uh, so, I will get back to looking some code and use the demo viewers again. Uh, and so we're not going to go much deeper uh, than this slide on, uh, in the next remaining 20 minutes. Um, if I, I used uh, a cube uh, by way of example, but if we look at something a slightly more complicated, the, a cylinder and and so when I've been, I've been talking about why have you got a 2d curve what's real what, what just what is the role of a co-edge and why might you have 3d 3d curves instead of 2d curves when in the boundary representation when you read data and you're you're describing a solid a bounded solid so You've got this notion of different, obviously we've got the faces, this top um, planar face, and this side cylindrical face here. So those faces themselves are, are bounded by, uh, obviously by the edges uh, and, and the adjacency information that links those two edges as well. But each individual surface um, they underline, we talk, I talked about the different geometry types in the case, they're defined in parametric space. So essentially you can think of them as unwrapping. Think of the label of a, you know, a jar or just the printed logo on a Coke can or something like that. That's really a 2D entity. It's just wrapped around, uh, you know, in, in 3D space. So you can think of, the, um, these 3D surfaces actually been in a 2D parametric domain. So you could see, for instance, this top surface here. I mean, it, it is in a, in a kind of planar domain anyway, so that maps across pretty straight. But the, this kind of curved surface here is just like a kind of rectangular label and it just wraps around. So the cur in terms of walking through our data structures and navigating the bounds often uh, and i know this from specific partner cases people actually want to work in 2d space sometimes a 2d parameter space so what the co-edges represent is the uh, the representation of this common 3d edge as a 2d edge in parameter space um, and essentially you could see the here in, in orangey red. There's, these represent, if you like, the the parameter space curve. Uh, sorry, the the co-edge uh, co-edges, and the blue represents, if you like, the real edge that you'd physically feel and see. And, and therefore, when I'm talking about 2D and 3D curves. The curve data you would get back from the 3D edge is going to be a 3D space curve if it exists at all, uh, and because usually because the modeling system that centers we got the data from just doesn't represent it, and the and the 2D curves are attached associated with the co-edges, and they're going to be um, they're going they're going to be in, in the 2D domain. Um, so this curve, as I said, this is as complicated as it gets. Just to say in UV parameter space, you might have a line. Uh, what is a line in 2D parameter space is a circular arc in 3D space. That's, you know, 
that's as good. So depending on what your algorithm is, what you want to do in terms of data access, maybe you want the 3D curves, if you wanted to follow the edge, say for welding application, or maybe writing your own tessellation algorithms, or you're doing something else that needs 2D domain information. Uh, and, and this is where uh, you'd look in terms of going to the co-edge and looking at the loops of a face. Okay, um, I said we want would get back to looking at some code, so let me do that. One moment. So we'll move on to this PRC to XML sample now. This is a startup project, and if we just look at the properties here, you can see. Um, I can set the properties here and what this will, what this will do is um, just read in the file format and dump the PRC data structure as an XML file. Now, inevitably, this can be very verbose. So um, for purposes of this demonstration, um, I've uh, talk, I've, I've just limited it to very simple parts. So if I just bring up the, the demo viewer again and show you the part we're looking at here. So if I, I've got a couple of parts here. One, I've got a cube. So yeah, we'll read that. It's not really a cube, is it? It's more rectangular parallel pipe or whatever. I'm, I'm um, and then we have a, a slightly more complicated uh, complicated object that is based on cylinders. In fact, I only just noticed before this talk, if I just click on this uh, data here, you'll find that depending on how I read it in, you may or may not find that these surfaces get converted. Some of these surfaces are NURBS rather than they look like they might be cylindrical, but they're NURBS. So what I'm going to do is just run, uh, let's do it with a cube, I think, just for purposes of this demo. So let's change this again to, let me just recheck the, the name of that file again. Okay. Okay, cube.xt. And we'll call this cube two, just because I ran this earlier. Uh, okay, let's apply that and we'll run this program. Okay, it's, let's have a look at this folder structure here. And there it is. Um, this sample is produced a conversion log here. So if I just drag this over from my other screen, um, you can see that it's read this data. It's a BREP reading mode. Um, I wanted to read solids and surfaces. These are the default settings. Um, we got some data out of it. Uh, okay. So essentially we got six faces out of this model. So if we now go, let me just take this cube2.xml and drag it into Visual Studio. And here you can see um, a dump of the data structure. So we've got a lot of, here is this data type I, told, I mentioned previously. Uh, the model file data, uh, which is kind of the root. We've got some information about the file format it came from and what the units there as well. Uh, if we go down a bit more, you can see uh, we should have at least one product occurrence. There we go. We've got a product occurrence there, even for one part. And in addition, we defined a uh, We've got the part definition finally going down to the representation item. Um, within the representation item, 
we've got additional data here. We've actually got the tessellation, te the face tessellation as well, which we'll, we'll talk about in, in a moment. Um, but here we've got the topology data here, the top of body data, context data, and so forth. So just without spending, there's the edge data, for instance. Uh, Without going into too much detail, just to let you know that if you are evaluating or even use an existing partner using uh, our toolkit, PRC2 XML, it's, it's a nice little tool just for taking a look at what data has been read into the, um, in, in, into the model structure. Okay, so let me return to the presentation. Um, let's do it from the current slide. Okay, that seems like I'll, let's get back to BREP. So we talked about BREP, we talked about the different geometry. Um, we got down as deep as we're going to go, and I just give you that demo. I, I, I am noticing that we're, I'm running a bit slow, uh, more slowly than... Uh, then I, sh I should be. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to skip over certain sections. I, you'll get all this information in a presentation because really what I want to do is just give you a kind of view as to talk about the known unknowns and, and so forth, the things you need to watch out for. So essentially, We've talked about reading the data, reading it from all these CAD files, that there's different data types in there, and that some systems handle data different from others. There is functionality in Exchange, both on reading the model and uh, post-reading post the model to alter the imported data to best match your downstream application. We call this adaptation, and there's a couple of functions, uh, excuse me, in in our uh, API to basically update the data force UV curves uh, uh, to be created if they're not there, transform surface types to ones that your modeling kernel or your existing algorithms can deal with better. And when you've got things like cylinders where you've got curves that go over essentially periodic surface, do things like split the UV curves. Um, I'm not going to go into it. I'm going to skip the demo on how you can modify the data and import. But Hoops Demo, other than to say Hoops Demo Viewer, does have some options on import that allow you, for instance, to um, change all the imported data to NURBS. But the, what you see in Hoops Demo Viewer is a subset of the capabilities that you can call upon through the actual API. Okay, so let's move on to the, poly, the, the poly BREP model. Uh, that is the faceted data. In the representation item, we talked about this BREP model. Now let's go on to the poly BREP model. The way you tessellate something can vary for different applications, whether it's just for display purposes or for analysis. The tessellation that you, you get might be different. Um, and so tessellation basically is, it's polygonal data. Uh, it can represent a polygonal solid, uh, but it's not necessarily a solid. It might, uh, and generally tessellation is very, uh, very dense data consisting of vertex coordinates, normals of polygons or triangles and information on how to interpret that, the, generally the connectivity, what this collection of vertices and normals means. Uh, so just to say uh, with regard to tessellation uh, and that there are different um, the different applications for the tessellation. I mentioned, for instance, analysis uh, or visualization, or it could be going to an additive manufacturing workflow. There are different control uh, ways of changing this. You can experiment with it in Hoops Demo Viewer under the tessellation options, but look at this uh, uh, tessellation data structure on read-write uh, parameters, and there are different 
uh, different options there to change the level of tessellation. And so, for instance, just to give you a quick look, you've got here's a very dense tessellation, and we've switched on for the image below uh, grid aligned tessellation. If you look at the image to the right, you can see the effect of an algorithm called accurate tessellation on different levels of tessellation as well. So, um, the default settings we have generally in, uh, for uh, Hoops Exchange are, are aimed at visualization workflows. So, if you just want to pull data in and visualize it, you can pretty much leave what's there already. Um, let me very quickly go into show you Hoops Demo Viewer. Um, I'm just going to going to load that model again so, uh, we've seen earlier the bleeder screw so if we just open this very quickly you'll see on our these import settings here these are predefined levels so if i bring this model in a very low level of tessellation you can see and then we look at the tessellation you can see it's pretty coarse if i bring the same model in but this time I'm going to change. You'll notice, by the way, when I read it in, I'm, I've got this option here of reading the B rep and tessellation or tessellation only. And that's something I didn't mention earlier. Uh, typically, uh, CAD models, they may often B rep. Sometimes there's tessellation in there as well, sometimes not. Particularly for JT, where there might be three different levels of tessellation. For some visualization workflows, it can be quicker just to read in the pre existing tessellation. But at that point, you've got the tessellation you've just read. If you're reading the B rep, you can regenerate the tessellation to, uh, uh, using Hoops Exchange. So I'm going to read this one in at high. Um, I haven't tried it extra high. I don't know how long it's going to take. Well, that was high. And if we just look at the tessellated view, you can see that the, if we compare the tessellated uh, the extra low with the high, it's a much higher quality of uh, visualization. So you've got the flexibility with the Hoops Exchange to alter the tessellation parameters either on reading or subsequently using functions to retessellate a model. Uh, and, and you can control the level and quality of the tessellation that you get out of Hoops um, Exchange. Okay, just to go on, we've talked about, I think given the time, I'm, going, I'm not gonna get too deep into this subject other than to say this, and that is tessellation is more, Tessellation in some ways is more complex accessing the data than um, accessing the boundary representation, although boundary representation is inherently more powerful. Uh, and and the, re the reason for this is that, first of all, tessellation in, is very dense and it's packed in a, in, a, in a kind of indexed way within Hoops Exchange to make it more efficient for storage. And there's a kind of core 3D data for displaying shells of solid. You might find wiser curves there and then you can get the tessellation on a kind of per face basis as well that map onto the solid's face. Um, Again, this this will be available for you in download, but this is just to show you the relationship between the different tessellation representations. And you'll see these references to indices here and this kind of index-based way of accessing data to, uh, just to make it compact and, and efficient. And, and one more level that makes it, I, I'm, I'm not saying this to frighten you because hopefully I'll suggest ways of accessing it without kind of, getting too deep here but the tessellation data we get as i say some we can we can generate tessellation data ourselves but often we read it um, say from cgm from a katia file or the solidworks tessellation we read it from the, uh, the native cad system and they may encode that visualization data in different ways either as individual triangles uh stripes uh uh or, or fans. For those of you who've worked with OpenGL directly, you'll be familiar with this type of representation. So 
when interpreting, you've got this combination of different methods of representing triangles we have to cope with, uh, triangulate, triangle-based data we have to cope with, and we've got these flags, uh, different combinations. So it can get a bit complicated kind of to account for that. Fortunately, we try and make it easier for you. you and this is a bit I really want to just briefly mention the visitor pattern. And the visitor pattern is a method of accessing data uh, in a Hoops Exchange data model that we use to make it easier to kind of what is one way of accessing the data? You don't have to use it, and indeed we have options to uh, alternative options. But it's used by a viewer sample, uh, a feature tree sample, and a collision detection sample. We've got many of you will be familiar with the vi um, visitor design pattern, which is a way of separating an algorithm from the structure on which it operates. And essentially, you create virtual. It works on the basis of callbacks. We provide uh, if you like a, a default navigation through our data structure and you provide a callback so that as our traverser reaches a, a data type of interest to you, you can, can do something with that data. Uh, this is a bit too de um, uh, detailed, so we'll skip over, but basically it, it's a kind of justification to say that for parsing PRC, because PRC is a pretty stable data structure, it makes sense to use visitor pattern in many cases. Uh, I am going to sh just run through some code in a second using that viewer sample, uh, and hopefully we can skip on pretty quickly after that. Uh, but um, essentially, we're looking at uh, you can use this traversal algorithm for looking at product structure, views, PMI, handling transformations. Cascaded attributes are things to do with color and visibility and, and gain access to the B-rep uh, um, uh, and, uh, and tessellated data as well. So just to move on, essentially, the, what you'll see if you do get to look at the code, which we provide in the samples, is you'll see this notion of visitor enter, visitor leave. That is, for here, for instance, a high level representation item when that's visited you can uh, say at this point what well, we're, we're looking at the transforms here and just building up a transformation stack for the for the uh, local coordinate systems okay so let me just run through very quickly uh, another code sample code sample here and this will be the last code sample i show and we'll get we'll go pretty high up after this point so um let me just set this as a startup project. And I've already set this sam code sample up. It's a simple open GL based viewer. Um, and it uses this codes, um, these visitor pattern. As you can see, we've got this tree traverse. And these essentially encodes, if you like, a reference way of walking through our data structures. Uh, um, we've got uh, visitors that do something when you get to nodes of visitors tend to you can have multiple visitors running on the traverse so these are visitors connected with tessellation visitors with transformations and so forth and finally the, the, we've got connectors um, which are the date which essentially is a kind of data type that connects makes a connection between the underlying data type you're working with like a face uh, or in this case, you can see it's tessellate, 3D tessellation and the kind of your own code there. So it, it's, it's, once you get used to it, it's not as complicated as it sounds. And if I just look at the properties again, you can see hopefully I've set it up for this screw, uh, bleeder screw again. So if I just run this sample here, and I'm just going to run it without debugging, and it's just come up on my other screen. So let me drag it over. There we go. This is a simple open gel based uh, kind of application just to view the data that you brought in. Now, I'm going to run this program again, but this time I'm going to run it with debugging because I, I put some breakpoints in earlier. So if I just uh, run it now, you can see here at this point here, um, We've come to 3D, a connector for tessellation, 3D tessellation. So at this point here, um, 
this is a connection here and this i i mentioned i showed you earlier that this 3d data and then the space data at this point here we're not really doing a ton other than to look at the transformations at this point so let's continue on a bit further and we've now entered a phase space uh, data connector here and so at this point uh, the traverses, it's walked down that, that whole PLC data structure, starting at the, mo uh, the model data file, going down through the product occurrences, getting through the part to the representation item, and now we're into the topology. We've just visited face, and we need to, uh, well, in fact, the, we've got down to actually the uh, representation item for uh, tessellated data, and we want the triangles so we can create OpenGL data from them. And you'll see here, effectively, we've created a connector. We've got a simplified way of getting the data as triangles in one uniform way. So if you look at, if you want to try using this at, in your own time and look at it, this is a, this is a really uh, a simplified interface. You don't have to worry about those tri strips, uh, about those tri fans, or, or the individual coding as whether or not you've got um, uh, whether or not you've got a, a, a surface normal per triangle or surface normal per vertex. And, and essentially, that's all I want to show you. There's three code samples that. Uh, uh, let's just stop debugging and just go back to the main. There's these three code samples here that I showed you today, import export for really trivial, trivial but uh, useful uh, way of importing a model uh, file and exporting it. We took, looked at PLC to XML as a way of looking at the underlying uh, PLC structure. And we've looked at the viewer sample as a way of getting the triangle data. So that is kind of, oops, excuse me. Um, one moment let's just get back to the where we were and we got through the triangles and we got two visitor pattern and there we are let's do it from the current slide not the beginning okay so from this point in i've just got i've just got a few slides i'm not going to dwell on them most of them are very one word type of slides um in addition to reading data, the Hoops Exchange does have a lot of internal, uh, well, external functionality as well that can support your workflow. There's, there's obviously different tessellation algorithms for different workflow. I already mentioned analysis and additive manufacturing. You can query the data. You can, you know, query the surface and curves, walk around the topology and the curves, and you know, get a uh, get the exact coordinates. We have functionality to project point clouds in an efficient way onto the surface object, compute uh, cross sections, and analytics representation. And if you bring in a NURBS model, actually trying to identify what the underlying analytical data types and manufacturing surfaces was. And, and I didn't really dwell on this on model import, uh, but sewing as well and healing. When you do bring in CAD data, you have got this issue that particularly for IGES and STEP, some of the data we get in or has been exported from other systems is often, it can be bad and it needs face uh, loops correcting. It may find, you may find there's not a real solid because the, the faces don't match properly at the ed, uh, common edge and so forth. Now that's not the case typically from a, a major CAD system or CAD uh, solid modeling former. Usually that data is pretty good and, and really what you're dealing with in adaptation coming from a, a native CAD system, you're dealing with things like different tolerances, whether they uh, uh, are different representations of the UV curves and so forth. Um, so finally, okay. You've read in Hoops Exchange, okay, you can write to a file, but you want to do something and integrate it. Different ways of using Exchange. I talked about visitors. We don't have to go into that. Again, there's a direct link to Siemens Parasolid Toolkit. Uh, and that link is uh, with these functions here. You can convert in memory direct directly into Parasolid. I haven't gone into it, but there's also a code sample, translate to PK parts, that also is in that um, solution I just showed. 
and there's also a separate uh, demo viewer called Hoops Parasolid Demo Viewer, where you load in a model and it will also show you the parasolid entities that correspond to the Hoops data types as well. If you're working with Hoops Visualize, I would encourage you to look at the component classes. When you re this is a really easy way of getting CAD data into a visualized-based application. The component classes represent a bridge between Exchange and Visualize. And, and we tr for those of you coming from a C sharp background, I, I should say, Exchange you can bind uh, C, uh, C sharp. We have uh, two Exchange. There's a a, a net wrapper code sample. You, some of you may have noticed, but. If you want to really work uh, in an easy and equal way with C Sharp, particularly for view and markup applications, take a look at going in through Visualize and using the component classes. You can get visualization, you can get metadata or attribute data. And if you do need to go a bit deeper, you can get the underlying uh, entities from Exchange in the same session and call additional functionality or data that may not be exposed through the component interface. Hoops Converter is part of Communicator, and that's a web visualization toolkit. Uh, we use Exchange as part of the process of converting the CAD models to the Hoops Communicator stream cache. Um, and it's based on Exchange, and it can read, it can extract the product structure, visualization information, obviously, metadata, product manufacturing information, and measurement data. So again, some of you might be familiar with the Hoops web platform. This is where, and that's why we include Exchange as well as part of Hoops, web, uh, as a communicator and um, publishers part of the Hoops web platform. And finally, something is a bit more experimental. It's, it's a Hoops Exchange Application Toolkit, which is a lightweight complementary C++ toolkit for working with a PRC uh, data model. And it's built on top of the Exchange API. It's very lightweight. and here you can see some it doesn't use visitor pattern though i think my, uh, under it, it you don't need to use visitor pattern with that uh, it, it implements a kind of rigorous navigation of our data structure underneath but essentially it, it just provides an alternative and for some cases simpler means uh, of accessing the data of uh, plc data structures for applications uh okay so we're nearly at the end now. Um, I'm sorry I've overrun by 15 minutes. You, I've kind of talked a lot. I've shown some code. If you are not already evaluating and you want to evaluate, this is where you go. Go to TechSoft 3D Products Hoops Exchange and press start a free evaluation. Uh, fill out a short form and that'll be set up for you. Jonathan's probably got more to say that. Uh, other resources to look at, I mentioned the Exchange Hoops Exchange to, uh, Application Toolkit. This is in labs.3d.com. This is a, a great initiative from Jonathan. And there's a lot of kind of sample applications and code and great ideas there. And, and in addition to the Exchange Toolkit, there's also a source code for a cross-platform CAD viewer. Uh, that uses Exchange and uh, Visualize together. It's for Qt, uh, and so it will work on Linux and, and uh, Windows as well. Uh, Developer Zone, look here, uh, and also Hoops Exchange for our, for our demo, demo viewers go to here. For, you'll need an access, access rights to get direct download of our Hoops demo viewers. If you're already a partner and an evaluating partner, you'll already be set up for that. And finally, handing over to, uh, jump back to Jonathan, we've got the upcoming uh, to, uh, virtual summit. And there's one tomorrow, I believe, Jonathan. There is, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Peter, fantastic. Just just all, all in all, thank you so much for, for that. Yeah, so there is a virtual summit um, tomorrow. We have one both, um, in the afternoon in uh, in Europe as well as in the afternoon in the U.S. Uh, so I know I know for us it's it's 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. Pacific time. So however that translates to your time zone, and you're you're welcome to to join there. Um, thank you, Peter. It was very aggressive to get through 60 slides in 60 minutes, but I knew you were up to the task. Uh, sorry for running over. We had a couple of good questions. If there are other questions for Peter. 
um, put them here in the chat. We'll answer those now. So um, one I didn't get back from uh, to David here, it was about the C++ API. So we, we did introduce a C++ API to Hoops Exchange. It was in beta for a little while. We rolled that back um, and trying to evaluate how best to move forward with, with a C++ API. Peter did show you um, a toolkit. You called it Heat, the Hoops Exchange app application toolkit that you can find on the TechSoft Labs. Um, that's a very powerful C++ wrapper for Hoops Exchange. And we're, we're actually, we have it there on the labs to kind of test it out and see uh, what type of, of usage and feedback we get from it. That may be the direction that we, we go in for providing a, um, a Hoops Exchange C++ interface. Um, we're, we're trying to, to try that out right now. Um, so thanks for that question. Uh, a few other questions. Um, Sam asked about the .NET wrapper. I'm glad, Peter, that, that you brought out the integration with Hoops Visualize. Um, and how Hoops Visualize, our graphics engine for desktop and mobile um, architectures, can run native um, .NET. And there's a, a very tight integration with Hoops Exchange. Not everything in Hoops Exchange is wrapped, but a lot of the major functionality that you want to have access to is, is wrapped through that integration. There's a sample project that, that wraps a few basic functions in the Hoops Exchange distribution um, that allows you to access Hoops Exchange data using .NET, and then the functions that you want access to, you can wrap yourself, um, is left up to you as, a, as an exercise. Uh, some other questions, there, there's a lot that came through. Uh, a question about supporting different file formats on Android and iOS. That's been a, a recent initiative of ours here at TechSoft to port our SDK to those mobile architectures. And so that's an ongoing project. Um, the, the main uh, CAD file formats, the native formats we, we've uh, ported. So that's like STEP and JT, kind of the neutral formats. And then we're working on other formats as there's, there's a need, right? So we try to meet our partners' needs with our technology and try to invest in and where people are most interested in, in support. So uh, I believe we're taking SolidWorks and porting it to I iOS is kind of like the next initiative, but there's a numerous other initiatives. So for building and construction, this kind of comes into a, another question is, is do you support um, unsupported file formats? And yes, every year we add new formats. Um, we've been working on Revit and DWG. Last year we, we added step XML um, we're, we're working on, I believe, um, Bentley MicroStation as a supported format in, in future releases. Um, and then part of that question was, how about unsupported functionality? Because a lot of these, these CAD formats, they support lots of different paradigms beyond the BREP. And, and we really pride ourselves on supporting project manufacturing information. We've been working on supporting feature tree and whole descriptions. And so, yes, every, every year, a part of our engineering efforts go into supporting more metadata. Right now, we're, we're working on feature trees. We're working on um, materials in Revit. And uh, we're also working on uh, mating conditions between parts and assemblies for some of our file formats. So, so again, if, if there's a very specific area that you're interested in su support that we don't have support for, that's really open to discussion. And uh, a lot of our engineering efforts go into su supporting um, those requests from, from our different partners. So those are the, the big questions. I think we hit all of them. Before we say goodbye, any, any other questions from, from our audience today? Thank you so much for joining us in this virtual space. We really do appreciate your interest and, and also your partnership. So I see a lot of people that we've, we've been working with for, for many years. Hopefully you learned a thing or two. Um, we'll be connecting what, one of those more technical questions. I have to go back to engineering and, and get some, some answers around, around loops and, and the order that they're presented to you through the API. So we'll be following up with you on that. Oh, we, we encourage you to reach out to us, particularly through the use of an evaluation. So all the technology that Peter's been presenting today, the documentation, the source code, the demo viewers, if you go to techsoft3.com, evaluate, uh, you can sign up for an evaluation. We pair you with somebody like Peter. So if you're in the UK, you get him uh, to answer some of your technical questions and guide you through an evaluation. Um, so we have a, a, a number of um, 
consulting engineers. That's part of our evaluation process is to make sure that your technical questions are answered and that you build a, a prototype using your technology to really test it out, use it with your own data, integrate it within your own app application um, so that you're familiar with it and, and can trust it. Um, so please sign up for that. Uh, check out our other seminars. Uh, so tomorrow we have one on building and construction. Next week we have one around um, manufacturing as well as our other training sessions on, online as part of this virtual training series. We have one next week around our web technology and using Docker, which is a component technology for distribution of, of web applications. Um, so, so we're excited to be talking about that next Tuesday. And then the following Tuesday, we'll be talking a little bit more about Exchange, but mostly about a resold toolkit for machine works called Polygonica. That's used for mesh processing and taking your data and, and preparing it for 3D printing or analysis or, or shrink wrapping it and, and uh, simplifying it. So there are some other, other use cases for uh, Polygonica, mostly though that are known for preparing data uh, for 3D printing, fixing holes, adding supports, uh, slicing it, uh, hollowing it out, thickening walls, uh, all those things are, are what Polygonica is so good at. All right, so thanks, thanks everyone. We, we appreciate you, you being here today. Feel free to reach out to us uh, through our, our contact us form on the website. I uh, encourage you to, to take a look at our technology and, and most importantly, in, in these tough times, be well, be safe, and we look forward to meeting you in person, hopefully in the near future. All right, thanks everybody, and please enjoy the rest of your day. All right, Peter, thank you. We're going to end this session. Bye, everyone.